Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our worship service here at Lebanon. It's a beautiful, beautiful Lord's Day. We love having a great, great gospel preacher here for our gospel meeting, and uh, Brother Robbie did a good job on Sunday school, and we look forward to a, a tremendous week this week. We want to encourage all of you to come back any and every chance you have. Uh, we're so thankful for our visitors, and uh, it's good to see you, and we hope you feel welcome and want to come back uh, more in the future. Uh, our service times are Sunday at 10 a.m. Bible study, 10.30 is worship, 5 p.m. is our evening worship normally. Uh, Wednesday at 6 is our midweek Bible study. Robbie wanted me to announce that he has some material up front uh, for the Tri-City School of Preaching that he, uh, he works at. And uh, so especially if there's any young men that want to go into preaching, uh, he would encourage you to get the materials. Um, our gospel meeting this week, I'll go through the itinerary right quick. Uh, we're going to meet uh, today. We're going to have our services this morning, then we'll have a meal. Then we'll come back at 6 tonight and 6, <coughs> excuse me, 6 throughout the week through Thursday. <coughs> it says Monday, Gary and Robbie will be together, so no meeting for meal. Tuesday is Subway in Piedmont at 4.15. Wednesday at the building, uh, Italian night, 4.30. And Thursday, Don Bogotis Mexican restaurant in Piedmont at 4.15. Our subjects this week, uh, this morning was the 23rd Psalm. The lesson coming up is the how long, O oh Lord, how long? Sunday night will be, but, I, but I've been baptized. Monday night, save to serve in a post-Christian world. Tuesday, do you really want to go to heaven? Wednesday, great is thy faithfulness. And Thursday, what Paul saw when he was blind. So keep those in mind, and we hope you'll attend all week if you can. Uh, we have a tremendous prayer request list. Uh, the shepherd has a lot of work to do this morning to help these people. But I'll go through uh, all of them now. Uh, Rodney Pollard. He had a four-wheeler accident and is in Birmingham. We have Gary McCurdy. He has a procedure on his hip Tuesday morning. I'm hoping that will alleviate some of his problems with his legs. Elaine and her family, Luane Goodwin, Mickey Enoch, Linda York family. Betty Bradley's coming off the list, but she said you can still pray for her. She's doing much better, but, you know, you can still pray. Uh, Chris King, Bobby Rupel, Robert and Sybil Darcy, Lori Patterson, Barbara Fell, Susan Minton, Ruth Mayhaw, Kaylee Brock, Kathy Austin, Margaret and Aaron Collins. They've had a lot of struggles the last year. Uh, Aaron has a kidney stone. He had to go to the hospital last night to put a skin in. He has some infection, so he's going to have to have some further care going forward. Uh, Gary Anderson has tests coming up in May. Danny Smith. Caden McGee and family, Jane Williamson, Donnie West, Mandy's friend Lindsay, Jessica Reinhardt has another cancer treatment tomorrow, Jean Barfield, Frankie Williams, Mary Jo McCurdy, she's in Encompass Rehab, Esther Thrasher, Chad Latta is due home from rehab today, Kenyon McGee, Jim Bone is in rehab at Gadsden Health and Rehab, uh, Laverne Beaver, uh, I believe she fell and broke her hip and her arm. Her husband, Donald Beavers, has his cancer, lung cancer has come back. Um, Laurie Williams has throat surgery tomorrow. Predale LeMaster had a heart attack and he's in rehab. And Leroy Hamby, uh, Sister Marilyn's brother, is in a hospital and uh, I think he had liver surgery, but he's not doing well at all. He may not make it, so we want to pray hard for him. Uh, participating this morning, Brother Derek's going to lead the singing. Gary Bragg's going to do our opening prayer. Steve will head the table with others assisting, and Ian will say our closing prayer and prayer for our food. So with that, we'll turn it over to Derek. First off, this morning, we're going to 499. Four nine nine. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Feel like traveling on 499. <laughs> My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on.
gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after for supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. The Passover is no longer. We're under the new and better covenant of Christ. And so, if you'd like to follow on over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. First Corinthians 5, verse 7 and 8, we read, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened, for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us, therefore let us, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we partake of it together. We read that we read that in Acts chapter twenty, verse seven. They came together on the first day of the week to break bread. And so when we take the Lord's Supper, we take it together. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. As we gather to remember the sacrifice of our Lord. Let us keep in mind what He went through for us. Would you bow with me? Our dear God in heaven, Lord, we give thanks for the opportunity to gather here this morning partake of this memorial. And as each one of us partakes of this load, let us reflect back on that wonderful sacrifice given on our behalf, this load that represents the broken body of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us do so in a manner pleasing unto thee. For it's in your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Lord God in heaven, our creator and author of our salvation, we thank you for sending your son to come to this sinful world and die for our sins. And we thank you, Lord, for not only the body that was broken and that was killed that day, we thank you for the blood that was spilled that 
washes our sins away and allows us to have eternal life. And we thank you, Lord, for this, this cup and this fruit of the vine that represents that blood that was spilled. And we pray, Lord, that you'll be with us as we partake of it. And we'll partake of it in a manner that pleases you. And it's through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. Separate and apart from that, the men have chosen to use this time to give back. We're commanded in 1 Corinthians 16 to lay by and store as we prosper. On the first day of the week, they came to give. And so we, we realized on the first day of every week, we come together and give of our means. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the rich blessings that you shower upon us each and every day. We're thankful, Father, for the precious blood of your Son that purchased the church. We pray, Father, that the men of this congregation will be good stewards of those funds, that they will be used, and they will be able to further the orders of your kingdom, that we might be fruitful in our endeavors as servants of yours to work for you. Thank you for these blessings you give us. Help us to be wise. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
you want to turn your song books to mark number 730, 730 from the song of invitation. And then let's stand and sing number 495 for the letter. 495. How beautiful heaven must be. We read of a place that's called heaven. It's made for the pure and the free. These truths to God's word He has given. How beautiful heaven must be. How beautiful heaven must be. Sweet home of the happy and free. talking about the number either you're just pretty and I am glad that you are here in our presence today worshiping with us our Holy Father in spirit and in truth be opening your Bible to Psalm number six the sixth Psalm and we're going to read some from Psalm six and from Psalm 13 and as you turn to Psalm six there are a couple of things that I want to say. Number one, I have got in touch with my feminine side, and I've already changed my mind for Thursday night. The lesson is no longer going to be what Paul saw when he was blind. That was a lesson I came across about 40 years ago, and it circulated throughout our brotherhood. And I got to, th I like the lesson, it's a good lesson, great material. And I got to thinking, I bet they've heard that a hundred times. So I'm going to do, I'm going to change the lesson, and Thursday night will be, He is my King. That's a lesson I just recently did, preached it the first time, last Lord's Day at Penville, and uh, it received a passing grade. So I'm going to share that with you Thursday night. A second thing, I am deeply involved in helping to train young men to preach the gospel. And I want to talk to these young men over here, if there's any of them that has any desire, any of you out there, I don't care what age you are, if you have a desire to preach the gospel, I'm interested in talking to you. I left my cards and uh, a letter and then uh, some brochures out there. I have more brochures if those run out. So please hit me up this week. We are at a tremendous shortage in gospel preachers in the church of the Lord today. There are many empty pulpits today. You're so fortunate to have the caliber of man you have to fill this pulpit to stand here Sunday in, Sunday out, Wednesday in, Wednesday out, when there are so many. Today, as I stand here, they're playing videos or listening to sermons on audio. And it's a, it's a cry and shame. We have everything that we need to fill all of our pulpits except sometimes the desire. The lesson this morning was a requested lesson a few months ago. We had a tremendous tragedy in our congregation. 
And uh, one of the men that was involved in that tragedy lost his wife and his daughter in an accident. He requested this material. Was it okay to ever question God? And I want to go through this material this morning. I thought if this wonderful Christian man had uh, need of this kind of material, maybe, just maybe, somebody in this assembly this morning is wrestling with something that has just brought you basically to your knees. Let's talk about it this morning. Begin with me in Psalm 6. Let's read the first seven verses. And then we'll flip over to Psalm 13, and then we'll read the first six verses of Psalm chapter 13. Psalm 6, beginning in verse 1. O oh Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O oh Lord, for I am weak. O oh Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. Now in Psalm 6... David is suffering from some kind of a sickness. It's not identified, but he's sick, and he's suffering, and he wants the Lord to move in his life. Verse 3, My soul is also sore vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for thy mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give, th uh, give thee thanks? I am weary with my groanings. All the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. Mine eyes consume because of grief. It waxeth old because of all mine enemies. Chapter 13. Begin with me in verse number 6. Or excuse me, verse number 1, we'll read the first six verses of this hymn of the Jewish songbook. Now, in chapter 13, Psalm 13, David is not dealing with the sickness. He is dealing with enemies. His enemies are the problem. How long wilt thou forget me? O Lord, forever? How long will thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall mine enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me. That word consider is, Lord, look at me and listen to me. Consider me. Lord, hear me and listen to me. O oh Lord, my God, lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest mine enemy say, I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord, because he has dealt bountifully with me. Have you ever laid awake at night with your heart so heavy, that you couldn't sleep because you didn't have the answers. Have you ever felt like David? In deep despair, you've cried out, How long, O oh Lord, how long? Have you ever driven out to some quiet place, shut the engine to your car off, and then pillow your face in your hands and cry out unto God, Oh dear God, help me. Have you ever gone out into your yard at night and fell on your face and watered the grass with your tears because you didn't have the answers? Brethren, until you've sought answers through tears, you could never understand what we're talking about. I talk to God, but nothing seems to happen. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there talking to God and you think, God, where are you? On your knees, praying, feeling detached and almost isolated from God. Have you ever been tempted to ask, God, are you really there? Job did in Job 23, 8-10. In his suffering, he had prayed and cried to God and all he received was crickets. 
He said, Behold, I go forward, but He's not there. He said, I look backward and I cannot perceive Him. He said, on the left hand where He does His work, He said, I cannot behold Him. And over to my right, He hides Himself that I cannot see Him. Notice this. But He knoweth the way that I take. And when He hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job said, I look all around me and I can't find God. In my deepest, darkest hour of despair and pain and suffering, I look to my left and my right. I look to my in front of me and behind me. And God is nowhere to be found. And even though Job could not see God, he knew God saw him. Is it wrong to question God? I've heard that all my life, Gary. Oh, you can't ask God. You can't question God. Well, is it wrong to question God? And ask Him why something bad has come into your life? I say it is not. Was Moses wrong in Exodus 5 and 22? And Moses returned unto the Lord and he said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evilly entreated this people? And Lord, why is it that you've sent me? Was Gideon wrong in Judges 6.13 when Gideon said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, if, thou, if the Lord be with us, then why is all this evil befallen us? Was Gideon wrong when he said that? What about Israel? Was Israel wrong in Judges 21 and 3 and said, O oh Lord God of Israel, why has it come to pass that there should be this very day one tribe lacking in Israel? Did Job sin? In Job chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, he asked God, Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? And why did the knees literally receive me or the breast that I should suck? Job was saying that dying was better than living and he was questioning God. Did David sin in Psalm 10, 1? Why standest thou far off, O Lord? And why hidest thyself in times of trouble? Did the sons of Korah sin in Psalm 42 and 9? I will say unto, the, unto God my rock, Why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of mine enemies? And what about Asaph in Psalm 80 and verse 4, O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with the prayer of your people? And did Jesus sin? In Matthew 27, 46, when he cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Brethren, we've all been there. And we've all in deep despair, in an agony of heart, we've cried out unto God. And because we've always heard, you're not supposed to do that, we felt the guilt because we did. Because we question God and the guilt. And then we begin to question about and wonder about our own faith. What's wrong with me? Why is God punishing me? What's wrong? What wrong have I done? And we ask ourselves then, when all of this begins to wait, how can I go on? I might as well just throw in the towel and quit, and many do. They ask, will the darkness ever end? Will I ever be happy again? And I tell you, brethren, that every one of these emotions are perfectly normal. I want to say that again. Every single solitary thing I've said that you may have felt is perfectly normal. God made us emotional beings. And to large measure, we're driven by our emotions. Some are driven by love. Love is an emotion. Some are driven by hate. Hate is an emotion. Some are driven by kindness and goodness. Some are driven by anger. These are emotions. And in this emotional state, some people blame God. When the devil is ultimately to blame for every bad thing, God gives you every good thing. James 1.17 says, Every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, 
with whom there is no variableness, that is, God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's no variableness, neither shadow cast by His turning. Every good thing that's ever graced your life is because of a benevolent God has given it to you. And every bad thing that's ever, the devil is responsible for every war that has ever been fought, every piece of crepe paper that's ever been hung, every wreath that's ever been placed on the door, every grave that has been dug, every drop of blood that has been shed, it is because of the devil. Every time the gavel rings and the words are said, divorce granted, that's because of the devil. Don't blame God for what the devil does. And asking God why is it sinful in and of itself. But we must not allow our questions to carry us to blame or doubt God. Seeking answers from God and doubting and blaming God are two different things. We ask our earthly fathers, do we not? We can also ask our Heavenly Father as well, why? So the issue is not, can we ask or even should we question God, but in what manner and for what reason we question Him, and what attitude do we have when we bring these questions? The prophet Habakkuk, he queried God concerning the timing and agency of God's plan. And Habakkuk 1, 1 to 3, the burden which Habakkuk saw, the prophets did see. Oh Lord God, I cry and you don't hear. Even I cry about violence and thou wilt not save. And why dost thou show me the iniquity of the people about me? And you cause me to behold all the grievance and yet... There's spoiling and there's violence all before me. And yet you have done nothing about it. <laughs> what about our society today? Could we not ask the question that Habakkuk asked about our society? Some people call Habakkuk the questioning prophet. Others call him the doubting Thomas of the Old Testament. Yet others call Habakkuk the prophet of faith. You see, Habakkuk was concerned about finding out why tyranny and wrong were allowed to continue in his day. And the book of Habakkuk opens in gloom and it closes in glory. And when God explains his plans, Habakkuk is fine with it. And the problem Habakkuk had was he saw all the evil, but God said, I'm going to use the Chaldeans to destroy Israel. But the Chaldeans were more wicked than Israel. And so Habakkuk was, God, you're going to use a more wicked people to destroy a lesser evil people? And God says, yeah. But when I get done destroying Israel with the Chaldeans, I'm going to destroy them. And Habakkuk said, now nah, I'm cool with that, Lord. You can bring it on. And you know how he closes his book? He closes it as a hymn of faith and a praise to the Lord. Read the last four verses of the book of Habakkuk. Many questions are put to God in the Psalms. Psalm 10, 1. Why standest thou far off, O Lord? Why hidest thyself in times of trouble? Have you ever read Psalm 44? The psalmist is crying out because God, he feels like that God has forsaken him in his suffering. In verses 23 and 24 of Psalm 44, Awake thou that sleepest, O Lord. He says, Arise, cast us not off forever. Wherefore didst thou hide thy face, and forget us the affliction and the impression of thy people. Brethren, listen. People have questioned God. Good people, righteous people, good men, righteous men. And the 74th Psalm, verses 1 and 2, O oh God, why hast thou cast us off forever? Why dost thine anger smoke against the sheep of thy pastor? And Psalm 77, seven to nine, seven, verses 7 to 9, he says, Will thou cast us off forever? And will you be favorable no more? Is your mercy clean gone forever? Does your promises fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in his anger shut up his tender mercies? 
Brethren, these are cries of persecuted ones. Ones with broken hearts. They're desperate. They're desperate for God's intervention and salvation. And through the prophet Jeremiah, God says, Ask me, and I will tell you remarkable things or secrets. Remarkable secrets that you don't know about things to come. That's Jeremiah 33, 3. What did God say? Ask me, Jeremiah. Ask me. Ask me. How could it be wrong to question God when Jesus Himself, himself commands us in Matthew 7, 7 and 8. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it shall be open. Now, those verbs, ask, seek, and knock, look at the first letter of each one. Ask, A. Seek, S. K, knock. A, S, K. Ask, seek, knock. Take the first letter and it says ask. We need to ask. Now, those are present tense. I don't want to be technical here, but I'll tell you this. They're present tense, active voice, imperative mood. That simply means, present tense, it's linear. You always are asking. You, you never not ask. And then their active voice. You, that's where the subject operates upon itself. You do the asking. And it's imperative mood. And in the Greek, that's the mood of the command. God is not giving a suggestion, or Jesus wasn't. He's commanding us to ask, commanding us to seek, and commanding us to knock, and never, ever quit doing it. And so many godly men in the Bible express their doubts to God about their ability to serve Him. Moses implored. He said, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and lead Israel out of Egypt? Exodus 3.11. He doubted his ability. He said, and he made all kinds of excuses and God overcame his excuses. Gideon questioned his ability in, Judge, in Judges 6.15. Gideon said, I am the Lee of the least family in Manasseh. Who am I to save Israel from the Midianites? Elijah in 1 Kings 18, he withstood 450 false prophets of Baal. And uh, in 1 Kings uh, 18 and 19, the latter part of 18 and the first part of 19, he flees before one demon-inspired woman named Jezebel. And he's in a cave hiding. And he's telling the Lord, I'm the only one. God said, Arise, Elijah. I've got 7,000 men in this city that's not bowed the knee to Baal. And what about Jeremiah? Jeremiah 1, 6. Jeremiah said, Lord, I'm just a youth. I'm a child. I can't even speak. God says, you will. You'll arise, you'll go where I tell you to go, and you'll say what I tell you to say. And guess what? Jeremiah's on his way. He's got his bag packed, and he's gone. You see, these men felt, and they were all fraught with the uncertainty about their place in God's plan. Abraham doubted God's promise. In Genesis 15, verse 8, God has made a covenant with Abraham. That he's going to have an inheritance. Chapter 17, verse 1, God appears to Abram. And uh, in that chapter 17, he changes Abram's name to Abraham, Sarai's name to Sarah, and he gives circumcision as the sign of the covenant that he made back in chapter 15. And he begins in chapter 17, verse 1, Gary, I am God Almighty. And you know what? An Almighty God can do pretty well anything, can he not? But guess what Abraham says in chapter, se in chapter 17, verses 17 and 18. He said, why, you've given a promise that an old man is going to have a son. I'm a hundred years old. And what about Sarah? She's 90. And Abraham, the text says, he laughed. Joshua questioned God's actions. And Joshua 7, 7 and 8, he said, Lord, why'd you bring us over here? Why not just leave us on the other side? Over here, what am I going to say to you when you see your people turn their backs to their enemies and run? Little scaredy cats. Even the Lord's disciples voiced their, res their reservation. Remember in 
Matthew 11, verses 2 and 3, John the Baptist has been arrested. He's in Huskow, and he's heard about the fame and works of the good Lord Jesus Christ. And he sends two disciples to say, are you the one? Men, good men, godly men have questioned God. And they've wanted to know why. Wondering and questioning God allows, uh, uh, God allowed a particular event about something that's happened in your life. And questioning God about that is entirely different from directly questioning God's goodness and His truthfulness. Having doubts is not the same as questioning God's sovereignty and attacking His character. These attitudes of attacking God for the, and asking God why from ill motives stem from spiritual blindness. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4. In short, an honest question from an honest heart is not wrong and it's not sinful and it's surely not offensive to God. But cross-examination from a bitter, doubtful, untrusting, rebellious heart is the fruit of unbelief and brethren, that's the stuff that atheists are made out of. God is not intimidated. God is not shocked. And God is not displeased by our heartfelt questions. He understands our weaknesses. He, even His Son, was tempted in all points like as we are. Hebrews eleven fifteen. So He knows our weaknesses. And yet, in those weaknesses, He still invites us to seek transparent fellowship with Him. You see, when we question God, our attitude should reflect a humble spirit, a trusting heart, and an open mind. It's better, brethren, to ask the question and to seek the answer than to let it fester into resentment, bitterness, doubt, rebellion, and apostasy. We can question the Lord. But His answer... Might be on our, might not be on our time schedule. We may think, man, this is taking forever. Have you ever prayed for something and you've been praying for it for a long time? And we think, this is taking forever. And so we might understand that God's time schedule, God doesn't wear a wristwatch. You and I do. But God knows our hearts, Psalm 44, 21. And He knows that whether we're genuine and when we desire Him to enlighten us about a question that we have asked. Our inner intentions determine whether it is right or wrong to question God. Well, what should be our response to bad things that happen to us? Let me suggest, number one, trust. Look with me in Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11. The words faith and trust are synonymous terms. If I have faith in something, I have trust in something. They're used synonymously. Hebrews 11, notice verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith takes what you can't see and makes it real to you. Verse 6, Without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that will diligently seek Him. Then in verse 7, He gives us the first illustration of what He said in verse number 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Notice verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God, why was he warned of God? That a flood was coming, right? To build an ark. What does it say? Of things not seen as yet. Noah had never seen a flood. Noah had never seen it rain. A moisture. A dew came up out of the earth and watered the vegetation. But faith, when God said, you build the ark, a flood is coming. Though he had never seen a flood, faith made that flood real to him. And it was as if he was standing in the water and it was up to his chin and it was rising. Faith takes what you can't see and makes it real to you. We may not see the answers. But we must trust 
God through the process because He's the one who has the answers. You see, doubt sees the obstacles. Faith sees the way. Doubt sees the darkest night. Faith sees the day. Doubt dreads to take a step. Faith soars on high. Doubt questions, who believes? Faith answers, I. Faith lives for the future. That's why we find men like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those patriarchs in Hebrews chapter 11. They look for a city which hath foundation, whose builder and maker is God, Hebrews 11.10. Hebrews 11.16 says, they look for a better country that is a heavenly. So trust God when bad things happen. Number two, seek God's comfort. In 2 Corinthians 1.3, blessed be God, even the Father of all mercies, and the God of all comfort. <clears throat> we looked at the 23rd Psalm this morning. Verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, O fear no evil, for thou art with me. Watch it now. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. When you're going through the valley, Seek God's comfort. Put your trust in Him. Number three, number three, when you're facing a difficulty in life, determine that you're going to rest in His peace. Isaiah 26, 3, He will keep you in perfect peace if your mind is stayed on Him. God is a God of peace. Romans 15, 33. The Lord Jesus is a Lord of peace, 2 Thessalonians 3, 16 to 18. The Holy Spirit's fruit is a fruit of peace, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The gospel is a gospel of peace, Romans 10, 15. So may our lives reflect the peace of God in all situations. And remember the two closing stanzas of Isaiah 57. It says, The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up dirt and mire. There is no peace, saith my God to the wicked. A man prayed <clears throat> every day at the wailing wall, morning and evening for 25 years, never miss a day. And when he was asked about it, he said, Well, in the mornings, I pray for peace. In the evenings, I pray for pros uh, prosperity. And when he was asked about how he felt about praying, 25 years, every day, morning and evening, he said, and I quote, It feels like I'm talking to a wall. Sometimes in our prayer life, it can feel like we're talking to a wall. We ask, and we ask, and we ask. It feels like <clears throat> at times that we're just not getting through. But our responsibility is to stay on bended knee and ask God and trust Him that one day when the time is right in my life, look, God can say yes. That's the answer we see, Christ. But no is an answer. Have you ever told your children, no, you can't do that? That's an answer. Wait a while, and you can't do that right now. You're going to have to wait a while. Wait a while is an answer. No, you can't have that, but you can have this. Something different. Well, God can also give us more than what we ask for. Or He can give us less than what we ask for. Those are all Bible answers to prayers that men have prayed in the Bible. Friends, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what your tomorrow may hold, but I do know who holds your tomorrow. If you believe, this is the getting on place now, to be able to have the privilege of prayer, to be able to trust in God when dark days invade your life, to be able to count on Him if you believe with all of your heart, without any reservation, that Jesus really is the Christ, the Son of God, willing to repent of your sins, confess His deity. And yes, He is God's Son. And then give your body to be buried with your Lord by baptism into death and raised to walk in a new life. 
Then he'll add you to his glorious body, the bride, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll be a Christian, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. And you can lock arm in arm with the rest of us, and we can fan out into this community, and we can make a difference for Jehovah God. Maybe you've done that, but you've strayed, you've wandered. Maybe you're not walking in the light as He is in the light. Would you not repent and would you not pray that perhaps the thought of thine heart can be forgiven thee? We're not in a hurry this morning. I know the food smells good, but we're not in a hurry. We'll take all the time that we need to assist you in your salvation. Let us stand and sing. Gary's going to meet you down front. Again. Wonderful story of love, great the immortal strength, angels with rapture announcing, shepherds with wonder receiving, Sarah wants to believe in, wonderful story of love.